Welcome everyone, and thank you for joining day four at Coalesce 2021. My name is Amada Echeverria, and I'm on the community team at DBT Labs. I'm thrilled to be hosting today's session, Modeling Event Data at Scale, presented by Paul Bluecock. Paul is the head of engineering of Data Engine at Snowplow. Paul spends a lot of time thinking about OSS, data, ethics, and privacy. In his spare time, he can be found watching Formula One on the weekend or out on long walks with his dog in the English countryside. In this 30-minute session, Paul will explore the common challenges companies face when modeling hundreds of millions or even billions of events and how to solve them. He'll discuss the differences between the cloud data warehouses as well as instrumentalization, performance tuning, and testing. Before we jump into things, some recommendations for making the best out of this session. All chat conversation is taking place in the coalesce-snowplow channel of DBT Slack. If you're not yet a part of the DBT community on Slack, you have time to join now. Seriously, go do it. Visit getdbt.com forward slash community and search for coalesce snowplow when you arrive. We encourage you to set up Slack and your browser side by side. In Slack, I think you'll have a great experience if you ask other attendees questions, make comments, share memes, or react in the channel at any point during Paul's session. And if you're new to the DBT community, or this is your first time at Coalesce, please don't be too shy. It's important to hear from new voices, so please chime in if you feel comfortable doing so. To kick us off, our chat champion, David Burton, a senior software engineer at DBT Labs, has started a thread to break the ice. So let us know who you are, where you're calling in from, and share what scale of data you're currently operating with and what it will look like in the future. After this session, Paul will be available in Slack to answer questions. Let's get started. Over to you, Paul. Thank you very much. It's nice to be here today, and uh, thank you very much for inviting me. Um, so to I might not be the face that you are perhaps all um, expecting to see today. Um, you may have signed up to a talk um, by one of my colleagues. Unfortunately, Will hasn't been able to make it today. He was in a little bit of an accident yesterday, um, so I'm filling in at the last minute. So please bear with me. This is pretty uh, pretty fresh in terms of material to me, um, but I really still wanted to shout out Will um, for the amazing work he's done um, putting these slides together. I'm just going to reap the, reap the reward now and hopefully um, do them justice as I present them to you. So um, I'm Paul Bucock. I've already been introduced there. I'm head of engineering. That's um, within the data engine function at Snowplow. And that's really quite a broad part of the Snowplow pipeline, all the way from trackers through to the core pipeline itself. And that does all the data enrichment and validation and including the data models um, that we build on the other side of the pipeline, I guess, to activate on those use cases. And um, when you've done that collection and with the Fifty million. That's a reasonable number. It's quite a big number. That's a pretty average size, I'd say, of daily events that we see being collected in Snowplow pipelines. And but when we start getting into these numbers of millions, potentially even billions, we start to hit some of the implications, really, or the the issues that we typically don't see when we're dealing with lower volume data collection. So today we're going to look at some of these implications of I've seen these large volumes in our warehouses. We're going to have to look at how we want to adapt our data modeling strategies in response to these ever growing event volumes. And really let's, so we'll dig straight in. Now, I think it's important for us to start with really going back to the core of what we're tracking here. And we call this behavioral event data. And the events that we're talking about today are really events that are captured when a user on a website, typically, but not always a website, it could be a mobile device, could even potentially be happening server side with some sort of server triggered action, maybe a transaction completes or something. Each of these actions that are done by a user or a service happen at a particular time um, and they have a corresponding state as well. Event occurs. So there's usually like an event name might have some properties, and often there's additional state with each of those events as well. So a few examples here, for instance, you may um, open an email, that's a user action. So the event might be open of email. And maybe there's some extra context information. So we capture events, 
and we call this extra context um, on an event. We say we capture extra entities for every event. So for instance, an entity might be whether an email has an attachment. If you do a page view, a classic thing on a website, we might be capturing things like the browser version, for instance, and additional browser information. If we're tracking on a smart TV, maybe a play or a pause or new video is loaded and uh, maybe we're navigating around the uh, ui of the the app we're going to be capturing things like the tv's firmware maybe the operating system maybe it's like a roku device or something and we'll be capturing extra metadata um, of that this all helps us understand more deeply about what's going on not just with what the user's doing but what's going on with that extra context around what and then maybe things on mobiles like logging in with apps and we might have some geolocation information too in that example so not only do we have all of our core events building up to that number, we've also got all these like sub, I guess like sub events, all this extra context information that's attached to all of these events. That causes us to not only have one sort of entity for the event itself, but all these extra attached uh, pieces of information, which just increases the scale of what we end up seeing in, in the data warehouse. So we have to consider scale even more so when one event could have 10 entities attached, that's something like 11 pieces of information that we need to think about. And if you're doing 50 million events a day, all of a sudden maybe we're at 500 million rows in our data warehouse table. So that's really where data modeling comes in. We have this raw atomic data, all of those events that are arriving into our warehouse. And the data modeling process is about applying business logic to that raw data to take it to a place where it's easier for analysts um, and other, other users of the data in the warehouse to extract business meaning um, from that data. Having the raw data is incredibly powerful. It allows you to trust your data. It allows you to quick, often quickly run some sort of ad hoc queries, but it quickly, as we'll see shortly, hits limitations. So this idea of data modeling allows us to wrap our business logic as well as have a number of other benefits that we'll spot in a minute to take that, that raw data and make it more useful. So we're gonna imagine a case study today with our friends, plant partners. And we can imagine here we've got a, an online retailer which is specializing in selling houseplants, founded in 2021, um, so this year. And this is an e-commerce site, and but it also has a blog. And on that blog, they're also producing like about plant care, sort of articles about plant care, things like that. And then they've also got the recover side, selling plants, seeds, and gardening supplies, things like that. So we're doing 2 million gross revenue in 2021, and, but we've got these lofty um, growth ambitions. And currently um, we've got 50 staff within our organization. And so a reasonable staff size, I and mean, probably quite classically, um, a reasonably small data team. But actually, maybe impressively, even with just 50 staff, we've actually got some data team um, involvement there. So we've still got a small data team, so some dedicated. We've implemented some sort of event tracking on the website, which is allowing us to better understand our customers' behaviors. So it's web tracking, so we're thinking page views, button clicks, interactions on a page, purchases, so transaction or e-commerce transaction information, and capturing all of that as well. And currently, in 2021, our site's generating 20,000 events a day. But where we might want to be, so as the years progress, we want to be growing, because we've got these lofty growth ambitions, our daily event volume um, significantly. I, if there's one thing I'm going to criticize Will's slide about, it's this graph. I apologize for the slightly logarithmic scale of some description, but hopefully you can see that the we're getting, we're getting up to 50 million events a day in a few years. So we're going to have to start thinking more and more about our strategy and how we're going to want to query um, this event volume as our company grows in maturity when it comes to our data. So a very typical first mark use case than the people would do in an e-commerce website and would be something like marketing attribution. So we've got this budget in our um, plant company to, to drive this customer acquisition. And the data team has been optimized with with TAS, sorry, with optimizing the spend. And what we could do, and what many companies would start with doing, is writing ad hoc queries to transform this events data into some sort of marketing attribution model. So quite simply, 
here. It's quite a simple sort of example, uh, but we see we've got these raw events coming in. So we've got page views, we've got people clicking on links, and we can see event ID generating on each um, separate event. Uh, we've got different timestamps and when they're happening. We've got the same user ID here, so we can stitch these together on the user. And we've also got the same session ID. This might be something slightly more complicated than integer typically, um, but you get the, get the idea here. And then we've also got their marketing fields as well, so we can see where where were they were they originally initially attributed to. We then might aggregate this up to something like this. So this is now being done at the session level. So we can take this session ID and we can easily see all of the same events which occurred for every session ID. We can take this time first timestamp or the min timestamp and the max timestamp, and we can then find the user ID that was all of these sessions had we can then take the marketing parameters and we can aggregate up how many page view events were there in this session and we can see was there a conversion event and then we know that this user converted because that conversion event fired so we can take that and we can do that sort of thing and that's a pretty classic use case so maybe every time we want to run the report we have this ad hoc query and we run it and we generate this output and we use that to to drive some sort of meaning for our organization. However, as we continue on that, that journey, our use cases are going to continue increasing. Marketing attribution is often the first, but it's rarely the last use case that a data team would um, come across. And that event data um, is really powerful for building things across all of these different use cases. These are another three really popular use cases we will see. Funnel analytics, have users gone through certain um, stages when they've been visiting the website, maybe within a session or within the lifetime of the user. Content analytics. So we have we have that blog that I mentioned where they're publishing material. They want to know scroll depth, how many people are reading the entire blog post before they leave the page and maybe do the next page view. And then another really cool one um, that we see quite a lot of people um, thinking about with Snowplow, particularly because of its real-time nature, is cart abandonment. So we have people putting things into their cart, but then never completing the transaction. You may have visited a website where they send you an email, maybe 10, 15 minutes after you've left their website saying, you've left some stuff in your basket. Would you like to come back and finish your purchase later? And you can model up potentially every 10 minutes, you could look at the last window of events, look for people that have added things to their basket, but they never completed the transaction. And if so, just send them an email. So as we grow in all of these use cases, these ad hoc queries that we're writing, maybe to solve some of those use cases, they become harder and harder for us to stay on top of. The biggest issue usually is our use cases become more complicated. And as our warehouse tracks more data, remember we're a couple of years down our line now, so we're in the millions of events, we're going to start seeing reduced performance. So our query execution times might increase. Um, our queue times, as in like, we've only got a certain amount of queries we can run in parallel on our warehouse, they may increase. We're waiting longer to get a slot to run our queries. And equally, we might then start seeing increased query failure rates. Um, query failure rates could be caused by like memory limitations of our data warehouse. It could be a timeout occurring because we're in the queue for too long, maybe there's a timeout limit or something, or just it takes too long to run, so the query just times out and never succeeds. And another thing that often happens, these queries are going to get bigger and bigger. So in some data warehouses, what's interesting here is the these two different problems that sort of exhibit themselves depending on the data warehouse technology you're using. So reduced performance is something I would typically consider a redshift um, sort of consideration. We're running on a cluster. That's changing a little bit now as, as like redshift moves serverless and has like RA3 nodes. Get a little bit technical there. But we still have to concern ourselves with the performance of the cluster, but less so about cost. We can scale up the cluster to get more performance. We'll understand the cost implications that we'll have. On warehouses like Snowflake and BigQuery, as our like table scans get bigger, as our queries get more complex and we're looking at more data or we're scanning over more data as we track more data, our costs are going to increase almost per query, particularly in something like BigQuery. Um, we've really got to keep an eye on what's going on with our costs as we, as those ad hoc queries get more and more complicated and our data sets get more and more larger. So the answer here is to consolidate. A lot of those four use cases that I described have very similar core things that they all need to leverage. 
So sessions was a great example there. A lot of them are going to be based on session. So cart abandonment, when a session expires and the user has not done a purchase, then we're going to send that email. We looked at attribution that was aggregated at the session level. Again, you might want to do content analytics at the session level. All of these things have the same sort of session aggregation as part of what they need to do to output their results. So if we can aggregate those raw events up into different levels, we can significantly reduce the amount of data that we need to scan to actually look at those use cases. So page views 20% here as a typical size for going from raw events into an aggregated page use table, 6% if we then aggregate them to sessions and even less, maybe even just 3% when we get to the users table. Now we can take that one step further. Creating those base aggregations saves, can save us a huge amount of cost. I mean, it can also save us a huge amount of time. But how do we actually build those tables? So as that raw events table grows, the aggregation into page views, sessions, and users also grows and gets bigger. And that query takes longer to run and gets more expensive. So if we, there's two ways to do this. We either drop and recompute, or we build an incremental model. If we drop and recompute, we're throwing away those three tables every time. And we, we then end up rebuilding those three tables every single time. That's going to become slower and slower as we get more and more data in that um, atomic raw table at the bottom. However, if you can think of an incremental model where we only try to add the data that arrived since the last time we ran it, then we can basically solve all of those problems and our the size of our queries is becomes relatively stable it only become the only grows in line with how many new page views we have for each one we're not having to recompute all of history every single time so hopefully you can see this code i've tried to make it as big as i could fit on the slide and um, please tell me if you can't and i'll uh, pop my screen share uh, my camera off to hopefully make it a little bit bigger um, but a drop and recompute model and every time we just drop the table and then we do our computation. So just a really simple example, we select the page view and a lot of other properties. And we're going to do an aggregation looking at the page view ID, um, looking at, sorry, how the, the number, the ID of the page view based on the session. So this is basically like the index of the page view within the session. So giving us a count of each page view ID um, and when it happened. And we're going to order it by a timestamp. So we're getting page view in session index and from our events table where the event name is page view. We can just drop and recompute that every single time. Alternatively, we can build something a little bit more complicated. We can look at an incremental model. And the big difference is this bit's relatively similar down here. But in the middle, we've got this with sessions with new events. And the name gives it away. What we're looking for here are any sessions that have seen a new page view since the max last timestamp that we've seen. So we look in this table and we check the largest timestamp that's currently in this table. And then we only include sessions that have had page views greater than the last time we run our model. Hopefully that made sense. We can then join that information into our um, model and it limits down the number of page views that we need to reconsider. There's a few other things to watch out for here. Um, we'll take a look at the CTE, sessions with new events that I showed you a second ago. We want to ensure that this filter, this incremental filter, is actually on the partition or the sort keys um, of your source. So in BigQuery, we have partition keys. In Redshift, we might, we'll have sort keys. Now, actually, a lot of Snowplow users don't use derived timestamp as the timestamp of that's their sort key. Potentially, a better timestamp is actually to use collect timestamp because that's guaranteed to be in a better order. Derived timestamp can change a little bit. I won't go into what derived timestamp is, but it's not as consistent as the collected timestamp. So, switching that out for collected timestamp is often a safer bet when it comes to incrementalization. You will miss less events in your incremental model by using collected timestamp. We also want to consider um, restricting table scans. So a warehouse like BigQuery, we're going to get more and more data in our scan 
as time goes on. So we're still look, running from the events table and we don't want to scan back all of time. So instead, we try and limit our table scans. So this section at the bottom here. So in this example here, we're just looking back three days. So we're only going to include new sessions that, have, that had page views within the last three days. This will limit the amount of data we need to scan back over to check for new page views within that session before we then reprocess them. This is a huge cost saving. And this number here, this is something you can configure depending on your website, like how often um, do people revisit and things like that. So you can, some people have run that as a week, some people will just run that as a day. It's a huge right, decision to make, but it can have big implications on the cost of your models that you're running and maybe even the performance as well. And lastly, and I've touched on this all the way through, understanding your warehouse. So understanding exactly how you set up your sort keys, what your tables are partitioned by, understanding the cost model and the performance model of your warehouse, Redshift, BigQuery, Snowflake, typically, are the three that we will have, that we see, and maybe even Postgres, and has very particular performance characteristics, and as often useful for lower event volumes. Um, but really understanding what's going on there. It's a little bit out of scope for this talk um, for me to go into too much detail. But yeah, getting to grips with the intricacies of your warehouse is really important. And we'll see that in the Snowplow web model for DBT. It considers the different warehouses in terms of like how it wants to run and execute across the different warehouses. Now, there's little things you can do in terms of performance tuning. Some of these might be obvious to those of you that have been writing SQL queries for a long time, maybe less so if you're new to this. Not joining to yourself is a is a classic anti-pattern that we want to try and avoid. Ensuring you're picking the right partition and sort keys. And so I talked about derived collector timestamp. They can be important if you want to make sure your incrementalized model doesn't need to be like dropped and recomputed every now and again, that you can trust it on an ongoing basis. And um, remember that look back window is going to potentially miss some data, but it's going to capture the 99.9% .9 hopefully of those um, page views that might need recomputing, for instance. And be aware of the cost of what you're running. So this is an example. This is really accurate, but very expensive as a thing. And often as a query, sorry, because it's looking back um, and over it's a particularly expensive way to find out this first value of the user ID. And maybe less accurate, but a lot cheaper is just to look for the max user ID. Okay, we're always thinking about like, how much are we scanning? What's the performance characteristics of this query? Now that's sometimes hard to spot and a lot of that comes with experience. And a lot of that comes with using like debugging tools that are gonna, that are gonna come with your warehouse, looking at the cost profile in BigQuery in particular, you can see the, the price of your query. So considering that and then optimizing your query to try and lower that down by maybe being less accurate, but approximate enough, can often be one step to achieving some like improved performance or, or cost performance as well. Another thing you can do um, is choose the right upsert strategy. So I won't spend too much on time on this, but ultimately you've got your target table, you've got your, so your source table, and we're going to try and end up with a new resulting table when we've had this incremental run. So picking the right sort of strategy to ensure you're upsetting your table with this new information. And we'll see that you see that they both have C here, but we want C1AA to be what ends up in our resulting table. Picking the right strategy to achieve that can also yield additional performance gain. So in DBT, there's several native strategies for you to um, pick from. And we've got the merge strategy, very easy to implement updates and then inserts, but it's a uh, reasonably unperformant upset. And I think that's pretty typical for most things, easy to implement, a little bit unperformant. Or you can have the insert and overwrite technique, a very performant upset, but replaces entire partitions at a time. Or perhaps we could even have the best of both worlds. And so if we look into the um, Snowplot model, and we'll see that we've tried to balance this. Um, with a new type of sort of incrementalization based on some of the principles that I've briefly spoken about today. So we're trying to limit the table scans on the destination table and in our update insert, 
uh, to, we're using the update and insert technique to ensure that we only process at, um, the least required data. What does our, uh, in the snowplow, so now there's a snowplow um, web model for DBT, and we've taken a lot of our learnings that we've had over the years, and we've brought those into our new incremental model. Um, so we've got um, this architecture now that leverages all of those learnings and allows us to build something that's both performant and considers the cost as well um, when we're running in different warehouses. So some benefits here to our, this incremental model that we've built. And I'll dig into it in a little bit more detail in the next slide. It's very easy to increment um, to implement now. It's fully incremental, takes all of those learnings into it, and isn't going to throw away data besides that sort of scan limit that I described. And it's all done in native DBT. There is a few cons. We are going to spot the same data again. So we've got to identify what that is, which can be a little bit intensive. We've got in this case, we're only looking at page events, um, and it is still very tricky. So I mentioned a lot of that you might want to build these adjacent use cases off of some of these tables. It's quite tricky to build in additional incremental models off of these derived tables, just because of some of the complexity um, that's happening around here. Not impossible, but yeah, you've really got to understand what's like going on under the hood. Hopefully, I've touched on some of that today, and but diving into the Snowplow Web DBT package is a um, Hopefully, it's a great learning opportunity for a lot of people, and it's obviously all open source, so you can go in there and take a look and see how we've solved some of these problems in this relatively complex space where we're dealing with millions of events. So that's what we had before, and that's the core, right? So we've still got this, and it was all incremental, and um, but now as we've that extra complexity now um, comes in when we start looking under the hood a little bit further. And we see that we've got this raw events table. And what we now do is we calculate the events this run. So these are all the events that we need to reprocess. And we store the latest timestamp that we saw. And we use that basically on every event to check. So I mentioned the max timestamp thing earlier. That's basically how we do this. We basically got this metadata table over here. And then we take these events that we need to process, we, and we drop and recompute these yellow tables. So we then look for the page views that are a part of this run. And then we use this upset strategy to upset into page views. So rather than trying to figure out all of the incremental logic like we previously did here, um, so same fundamental stuff, but we've introduced these additional tables to try and simplify some of this and reduce the query and make it more performant by generating these drop and recomputes to make, so we're not reprocessing too much information. We then take the page views, we generate sessions, we upset that, and then we actually use the session information to build a user's this run, reuse that derived table. So there's an example here of using one of the derived tables to build another derived table. So we end up with page views, sessions, and users, same tables, but helping us to hopefully making it a little bit easier to take part in this architecture. There's, there's points of extensibility now in here and um, that maybe previously were harder to spot with the previous um, incremental architecture. However, this is pretty complicated now. So in terms of the, so whilst there's extensibility points in here from our point of view to maintain this, it's actually pretty tricky. Luckily for you, you just get to reap the rewards of this architecture. But yeah, there's a, it's maybe if you want to like contribute or get involved in sort of this section, it's pretty, it's pretty gnarly. But I do, if you're a bit of a DBT power user, go in and have a look at this model. I'd hope that you um, find it particularly, particularly enjoyable. So in summary, I think I'm about bang on time. This event data can solve a huge array of business needs. They were just four use cases. We did a little exercise a while back. We identified 39 different use cases that were pretty popular and common to use behavioral data to build. But a lot of them do require this aggregation and building this set of derived tables. That allows, and a lot of them have got commonality. So those derived tables and building those out are really useful. We've got separate models for web and mobile. The mobile one should be landing in DBT pretty soon. 
and then beyond there we can think maybe of more specific use cases as well so content analytics e-commerce video things like that and hopefully give you a, an idea that at some point dropping your compute just doesn't really fly anymore you're going to get to a point as your company grows and um, where incremental processing is something you need to think about something you definitely need to do things to always strive to do always in the back of your mind whatever you're building minimize the number of queries against your events table process the least amount of data possible and optimize your queries wherever you can get peer reviews it's amazing how just because of the experience we each have that's a little bit different we know these little tips and tricks so yeah always getting those peer reviews really important make sure you pick the right upset strategy for your needs and for what you um, want to achieve and where you're at as well in terms of your data maturity and then consider what incremental architecture is best suited for you there's a number of ways of doing this we've gone for quite a complex approach there's simpler approaches as well in terms of the way you can build an incremental model and it really it's a bit of a maturity curve right you're probably going to get to a complicated place eventually but you don't have to start there you can just go on that journey to get there and that is everything from me today so I'd like to thank you all for listening. I hope that was okay. I found out this morning I was going to step in and do this. Um, so I hope you enjoyed that. I can see lots of questions in Slack. So I'm going to head over there now and I'll go and start answering some of those. Thank you very much.